Well, thanks, George. Uh, with us today, and as no surprise, is George Siemens. He's a professor at the University of Athabasca and a research fellow. Have I got that right? A research fellow at the Technology Enhanced Re uh, Knowledge Research Institute. That's right. Yeah, I'm with uh, with TechRe, so that's yeah. sort of the abbreviation of it, and uh, mainly focused on on research activities there. Yeah, and, and George is better known to everybody in the whole world as uh, as the father of connectivism. <laughs> <laughs> I think I mentioned the last time we talked about this, this is one of those rare times you actually get to talk to somebody who has their own ism. <laughs> yeah. and, and I'm not sure if that's a good thing, though. <laughs> well, we'll let, we'll let other people just decide that. <laughs> well, George, uh, if you don't mind, if it's no trouble, um, I know this is ground you've been over a thousand times, but just pretend somebody was walking into your office for the first time and they'd never heard of it. Um, what would you tell them in a nutshell that construct constructivism actually is? What would you say? Uh, sorry, constructivism or connectivism? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you aren't the father of that. I just, <laughs> no, yeah, but, I, uh, my well, fault, no, connectivism, of course. Sure, and, and, uh, and I'll just do a quick uh, sort of a preface to talk about uh, you know, constructivism as well, because typically these two concepts are sort of brought in relation to each other. And so people say, you know, what is constructivism in relation to connectivism? And uh, in the past, I tried to actually answer that question. I think I've given up a little bit of hope on that because uh, constructivism is such a broad umbrella. It's it's so difficult to really get down to what is it. And so usually my response now is, well, you know, let me know what sort of flavor of constructivism you're referring to. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, in terms of connectivism, uh, really the core assertion is to transition our thinking about learning and knowledge to one that's based on connections so that we see the activity in the process of learning through this perspective of how connections form. Uh, we see knowledge growth and knowledge development, again, through this idea of how connections form and how concepts are developed and built in relationship to one another. So the, the simple statement is that connectivism, not surprisingly, is, uh, emphasizes the primacy of the connection. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so really knowledge is even embedded in that model in the nodes in the in those connections you're saying yeah and, and Stephen Downs actually has written I think a good article uh, when, when he talks about connective knowledge on this same topic and when you take time and you pull back a little bit and you think about it it seems somewhat obvious and actually seems intuitive you know this notion that you know knowledge is in the connections and that our ability to to learn and to grow and to develop is really a function of our ability to connect and to pull pieces together uh, let me just give you a quick example on uh, of, of a sort of a real life illustration of how this came up uh, came together I think it was around 2003 where we had uh, the the SARS uh, virus or the SARS epidemic breakout and the, the virus that's responsible for SARS is the coronavirus. And we know that now, but at the time we didn't. And so what we had is essentially this point of knowledge deficiency. And, and it's not just that someone somewhere knew and we needed to connect to that person. We literally had to find out what it is this that we were dealing with. And the illustration of how it was discovered, the coronavirus, is, is actually, I think, a perfect illustration of this concept of connective knowledge, connectivism. And so what ended up happening was researchers in different labs around the world, they would sort of share their research results through really basic technology. At that time, I think it was primarily email and file sharing. And uh, so let's say Tokyo uh, hands off their research results to a lab in Europe, and when uh, Europe goes to bed, they hand it off to Atlanta, and actually Winnipeg was quite involved in this time as well. And this just keeps going really around the clock knowledge building and research sharing. They didn't share everything because there's sort of a proprietary component, but they shared enough so that mm -hmm. collectively this group of researchers were able to identify the coronavirus by the iterative and the progressive advancements that each lab made. So I think in that regard, sort of a very practical view of learning and knowledge as being an integrated process of really connection forming. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and this takes takes us to uh, a little conversation that I saw online that you and you and Stephen had. I think it was when you were teaching one of your CCK classes that um, you were talking about your different takes on connectivism. That you have a more social view of it, if I'm if I'm not overstating it there, and he takes a, a more AI kind of approach. I think, I think no, I think you're exactly right. If, and if you look at, uh, let's say, the people that we cite, it's like you know the friends you hang out with determine the person you are. <laughs> and if you look at, at the, the sort of the sources that Stephen cites, he he heavily emphasizes uh, philosophy of mind. 
So obviously mm-hmm. this philosophical tradition and background comes through. Philosophy of mind, AI, I spent a lot of time as well, you know, in this notion of uh, language and this notion of knowledge transfer. And he doesn't agree with knowledge transfer, but he, you know, how, how he defines that. Uh, most of the people that I'm more interested in uh, come from more a sociology or a psychology background. So I'm more interested in, let's say, understanding the work of researchers that have tried to, to look at sense-making, you know, organizational activity or wayfinding finding or in trying to pull those together as well as of course the psychologists that have defined uh, learning theories broadly and sort of which elements of those views you know can we still apply and appropriate if you will into connectivism so really there are two very distinctive uh, yeah. threads but we're distinct enough that we can get along i think if there's too much overlap there would be more conflict <laughs> that's that's interesting one of the, one of the things that uh that you talk about from your perspective, I've heard you talk about in the past, is that the whole notion of the difference, and I was always intrigued by this, the whole notion of the difference between complexity or something being complex and something being complicated and how that feeds into your ideas, particularly from the social side of things. Could you talk about that just a little bit? Sure. Well, probably the easiest way to look at it, uh, at least the way I've described it, is you know, a, a complex, or let's sort of complicated, a complicated task is one where everything has a piece. So if you're taking your car apart to fix something in the engine, and uh, when you're done, and if you've got a bunch of bolts and parts left over, something went wrong. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you, need to, you need to do that again before you take it on the highway. But that's a complicated task. It's like a puzzle. Every piece has a place. Something that's complex in contrast is uh, more uh, iterative and more difficult to predict. So that means that best example probably is the weather because we all experience it. So, you know, we listen to the news and it says, oh, tomorrow it's going to be sunny and we're going to have a picnic and, you know, whatever. And then all of a sudden it comes along and it's raining and it's miserable and, and it's like, well, you know, how can they be this wrong about this? But that's because complex systems, pieces are going to connect and interact in ways that we can't always anticipate. And because of this connection and interaction that happens at that, uh, at that systemic level, uh, we can list the elements that are at play, but we can't necessarily predict the outcome. Stock market's another great example of a system that's actually complex. You know, we can say, well, these are the conditions. This is happening in Italy. This is going on in Europe. The U.S. has got this whatever debt ceiling debate. And you can look at all of these pieces, and you can describe what each piece is. But how those pieces connect and combine is ultimately going to determine the impact. So in, in a way... Any complex system, such as learning in a connectivist model, uh, has to acknowledge that you can't really predict. You can describe what's there, but you can't predict what's going to happen based on how, you know, once you know how things connect, then you can. Mm -hmm. But we don't know how things will connect always. Yeah, and that uncertainty piece is really an important part of all this, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. especially in our society, it seems. And and you've carried that into, in a very practical way, you've carried that right into education. I mean, the, the, your experience with MOOCs, uh, I know Dave Wiley doesn't like the name, and I know a lot of people <laughs> have argued about that. And it's probably not the great. You've said it isn't the greatest yeah. name in the world, but massive, uh, op- massively open online courses where you have huge numbers of people uh, and then pedagogically some interesting things happen. Can you tell me what your experience has been or or talk a little bit about the whole idea of connectivism and how it's played out through MOOCs and and what you've learned about connect your your theory as a result and what you've learned about the application of your theory as a result? There's quite a few questions there, so I'll try and get to them. No, no, those are all very important questions. So really, 2008, when we did the first open online course uh, for for us, Stephen Downs and I, and and at that time, you know, your colleague, uh, Ali Koros and uh, uh, David Wiley had done open courses, so uh, we certainly can't lay claim to uh, uniqueness in that regard, and and it built on work that I had done with uh, an open online conference in 2007. So uh, with CCK08, our intent was to say, well, you know, the best way for people to understand connectivism is to live it, experience it. Right? It's, it's very much, you know, I found too, even years ago when I was talking about blogs and blogging, if, if you haven't tried it, it's very tough to understand sort of what are the unique elements and the attributes of it. We wanted then to give people an opportunity to experience what this is. And uh, the course grew more rapidly than, than I think what we had expected initially in terms of size. We had a you know, fairly strong number come out. And it was very interesting to observe what people started doing. And so essentially our offering and our initial humble goal was to do with courses, with teaching and learning what MIT had done with content, right? We wanted to open it up. And we had some really great experiences come out. I and mean, people, I think there's five different languages that were translated as a consequence of this. 
Uh, there were a variety of different uh, discussions that came out in different parts of the world. People were meeting face to face. Uh, people were setting up their own sub networks, their own subspaces where they would connect. So we had a second life component, Google group component. Uh, we had uh, Oh, I mean, you know, pick a technology. If somebody thought of it, they would go ahead and do it, which was really what we pushed for. And uh, we also had a variety of accreditation or, or marking schemes. We had one student, I think she was from University in Israel. Uh, she ended up taking a course with us, but her, uh, you know, she's doing her PhD, but her faculty member, her advisor, did all of the grading for her. Uh, so we, we did the course, so to speak. So, you know, illustrative views before is that teaching is, is global, but accreditation is local. And this is what we saw coming out here. So in that regard, the, the, this experience of being able to connect with people from around the world and in different languages, different perspectives, being able to exchange the, you know, sort of the level of dialogue was, was quite a fascinating experience in what it means to be connected. And uh, I've done some coding uh, based you know, on uh, using Cohere, which is an open source tool developed by uh, Knowledge Media Institute out of Open University. And so I've done some coding of, of the different forums and the discussion patterns that emerged, particularly looking at wayfinding and sense-making activities, because I'm looking at how do people connect and why do they connect. And, you know, it's really interesting to see some of these patterns and habits emerge, right? How on a, on a small subset, if you get one thread, this initial sense of I offer an idea, there's debate back and forth, people support it with personal experience, with academic resources, uh, somebody asks a question to clarify, and so there's this real sense of a, a social system guiding and sort of helping people get to a particular point. It might be as simple as understanding this one thread, it might be as complex as trying to understand the whole course. So I found that to be really practical instantiation of network learning because we were seeing people sharing resources and taking ownership of their spaces of interaction, which really is, is part of the critical aspect of, of this open course format. In all fairness, though, we're still very early in the game, and I don't think we, I personally don't fully understand where we're at, where it's going, and, and what's next. But I have found it interesting seeing, uh, as I just posted earlier today, about uh, uh, Stanford is offering an, an open online course. There's some debate, you know, you're, you're required to purchase the text. Is it really a MOOC? But uh, still, the teaching is open online. They've got 25,000 students signed up. Uh, it's a fascinating concept. And they've got the names, and they've got the name of the institution, and it's going to attract. I heard in their promo that they were looking at, they teach it to 200 students at Stanford, that they're hoping to multiply that by 1,000 times. Can you imagine? 200, they couldn't have meant 200,000 students. <laughs> that's, it's impressive. But, the, you know, you look at it on a different level, and that's, that's too bad, I know. But they've tried to automate the, the testing process, right, so that yeah. you can take a course, and, then, yeah. and it, it, not surprising, in an AI course, you're, you're know, going to automate some of the testing features in that, which is a great illustration. And, and just seeing how courses change. I mean, Ray Schroeder uh, from the University of Illinois just uh, is in the middle of doing an, an edu MOOC right now. And I believe there are probably close to 3,000 participants now, you know, and no, not every course is going to get that size, and, and you know, it's probably important that we focus not on the massive part, but on the fact that people, individual students have control, and they can sort of create these subclusters. Mm -hmm. If you've got 3,000 people, not all of them can talk to everyone. Yeah. And so I found, even as I mentioned, you know, coding the uh, discussion threads in CCK08, people would connect on a variety of things. If somebody said, I'm from Israel, suddenly you would get this subcluster. We had a few people from Brazil. They s decided to set up a face-to-face -face gathering. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people are connecting on geography. Uh, somebody says, I'm an instructional designer. And they say, I am too. So they begin to connect based on, on uh, sort of shared vocation. Uh, other individuals begin to share a few resources. So they begin to connect on ideology. And so it's really fascinating. It's like, you know, is, you know you're seeing this this mob of, you know, 2,000 plus people coming into this course space and what they're starting to do really is they're sort of bumping into each other and they're yeah. trying to make sense of who can I relate to, who resonates with me and as they begin to connect and relate they begin to form these little subclusters and sometimes these subclusters go into different spaces uh, such as like I said uh, groups that get set up in Second Life or other areas but you know it's just fascinating watching what happens when you don't impose rigid structure yeah. and you put 3,000 people in a space and you allow them to create their own ways through this complex information space. Yeah, and, you know, and it's also an interesting way to modify theory because all of that is a pedagogical, well, not even pedagogical, that's a bad word. It's an environment anyway that serves almost like a Petri dish for mm. you to go in and to pick apart some understandings about what you're doing. I, it's, it's an incredible organism almost right now, isn't it?
Well, one of the things, just a quick note on the, the fall course that we have coming up, it's called, yeah. you know, Change. And yeah. uh, it's, a, it's an open course uh, where we have even different people speaking, different areas uh, of interest in the, in the education field and technology and psychology as well. And what we tried to do, or at least this, this year, what I'm most excited about is we decided, you know what, we're doing these open course. There's all these, these trails, these digital threads and strands that indicate what people have done and how they've interacted with each other. Uh, it's just, it's like this huge data uh, set that somebody needs to look at and uh, and interrogate. So we've had about 55 people sign up now for this research group. And, you know, people who are looking at either from a discourse analysis perspective, some are looking at it from a social network analysis, some are looking at it from patterns of interaction. And so I'm, I'm excited about that because what we're really saying is here is, is this raw data set. Whatever theories or data or, or methodologies you've used in the past in your research, you likely won't find a more authentic interaction space than you will in an open course because it's not artificially contrived. So we're seeing, and I hope, you know, at this point at least there's about at least six or seven distinct research groups uh, from uh, you did, you know, the Catholic University in Belgium, from Open University, from uh, the uh, Caledonian Academy out of uh, Glasgow, and others that are saying, you know, we're looking at how learners learn based on goal setting and establishment. Others are saying, well, I'm interested in seeing how these social patterns evolve. The list goes on. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's a neat little... Uh, database for people to start toying around with and trying to, to even test or evaluate their existing views and theories. Is, it, is this a big part of your work at Techery? Are you, are you looking at learning analytics as a way to get at some of this stuff? Uh, that's it's a great uh, segue into the Techery point. Um, <laughs> I'll just make a quick note on what Techery is, as you mentioned at the start. It's Technology Enhanced Knowledge Media. Uh, uh, Technology Enhanced Knowledge Research Institute, uh, Techery at Athabasca University. And uh, it, it, we have really six key research areas, and I'm involved in three of them. And, and the way Techery is set up, each research team has a leader and then has a series of mem you know, people that are members of that team. So, for example, one strand that I'm involved in is openness in education. Uh, Rory McGreal, who's the UNESCO chair in, uh, in open learning uh, at Athabasca, he's the team lead. And then there's a group of about five or six of us that are researchers or team members on, on this team. Another one is social media and social networks, which John Drawn and Terry Anderson are the team leads, and, and again, I'm a member of that as well. And then the one that uh, I lead is on learning analytics, and there's uh, about half a dozen members, uh, researchers that are also a part of this as well. And so one of the fairly obvious uh, benefits, I guess, of digital technologies is that uh, everything is external. Like everything leaves a trace, right? You know, if you and I meet at a conference and we chat, it essentially is vaporized unless both of our mobile phones track our location and they can demonstrate we connected. But beyond that, the conversation is gone. Yeah. Whereas if you're in an online course or if you're blogging or in a social networking service, really every click is analyzed. I remember hearing Newton, a company that uh, does auto, you know, adaptive testing out of the States, they say they collect up to 150,000 data points on a student in an afternoon of using their system. And so all of these data points, they can indicate what are you doing, what's your mindset, uh, you know, attentional metadata. You know, Eric Duvall talks about this. These concepts start to come together and give, as educators, potentially new insight into what's happening in the learning process. Now, I've written about this notion of peak social, uh, where the, my argument is that we're kind of at a stage where can we really connect more? Can we, you know, if I add another 20 people to my network, uh, social network, you know, something has to change. Like either I, I skim more, I, I interact with less, you know, it's, there's a limit to how much I can do with social systems, yeah. which is really direct, directly at odds with what's happening in society, right? Mm -hmm. Where everything is getting more rapid and more complex and more information. So, I find at least I've hit my limit with the social realm, and so now I need to start looking at other ways to make sense of what's happening around me. And that can be through visualizations, uh, that can be through, you know, let's say automated systems, uh, you know, let's say algorithms that try and rank influence or the value of a resource. Uh, sometimes it's done on individuals through, let's say, a tool like Clout or Peer Index that tries to put a value on, you know, how significant is this person's contributions. And you know, these kinds of, so the trails that are being left we have limited capability to make sense of them socially. We can cluster socially in sub-networks. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the things of recommendations in terms of resources or in terms of, hey, you might want to connect with these people, uh, that's being left to uh, algorithms, analytics. Like they're, they're crunching through the data trails we leave and they're trying to make sense of what's there and what does it mean. So essentially that's what learning analytics are about. We're looking at uh, can we do a better job recommending resources to students? 
can we do a better job of highlighting students that are at risk? Yeah. Let's say there's a chance that, uh, you know, certain patterns, if you haven't logged in for three days, you haven't done this, you haven't done that, does that mean there's a greater chance George is going to fail this course? Yeah. And uh, statistically, if we have enough data, we can actually begin to answer questions like that. And so that's what we're now doing uh, within the realm of learning analytics and trying to improve the quality of real-time information that both the student and the educator has. But if you extend it more broadly, obviously there's benefit to the university system as a whole. You know, if you have, let's say, a 20% dropout rate in a university, what if you could, through proper interventions, uh, reduce that by a few percent or even 10%? It could have an enormous financial impact on the university, but most importantly on society because now people are increasingly successful in their learning activities. So. Those are some of the things we're looking at in the realm of learning activities or learning analytics. And in my eyes, it fits really directly within connectivism because what we're trying to do is understand the social and the informational uh, connections and networks that learners are forming and understanding what the implications are of those networks as they form. Yeah, it's really neat to see how those ideas come together. They really do come together to complement each other pretty well. Yeah, well, not pretty well, beautifully, and but uh, on top of that, it 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 must get lonely out there on the bleeding edge sometimes, George. I mean, you're you're really trying to push things in brand new ways and and look at even tools of of analysis in new ways. That um, uh, that that takes a lot of courage. Well, we were, you know, and sometimes, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Don uh, Swanson, he wrote an article, I'm not even, just probably about 20 years ago, and it was called Undiscovered Public Knowledge. And sort of his key argument there is that quite often we duplicate a lot of stuff, we just don't connect what's already there. And uh, that's a real financial loss, really an economic issue. But what we found interesting, and in we did a conference on, on uh, learning analytics this last year in Banff, had some great representation and when we were putting this conference together, one of the things I specifically tried to emphasize is we need to bring together people from different fields. I mean, you know, the, the people who are sort of more pedagogical or, you know, a social view of the world need to connect with people who are sort of more algorithmic in their orientation. Yeah. And so we, we tried and I think we were successful. It, it, it was a bit, it was awkward though for a period with the steering committee because at one point we were getting, as we were getting papers in, and uh, you know, we had some great papers. And then someone who has more of a traditional humanities, social sciences view said, well, these are all great papers. Let's accept them all. And, uh, but we had a few folks who came from the computer sciences field because we wanted to bring in you know, people from that space as well. And they almost had a heart attack because one of them said, too, if you go above 20% acceptance rate, uh, my students aren't submitting to this conference. And, and the reality is, you know, in your case, too, right, if you, yeah. you know, if you present at a conference, let's say if you're a new researcher, it's not going to really help you for 10 tenure if you're in, uh, in an education field. But on the other hand, the computer science field, your conference presentations are the That's valuable it. aspect. Yeah. So it was funny seeing these different worlds come together and just seeing how we had to sort of work through, through some of our differences. So when you mentioned sort of being uh, you know, uh, out on the edge and that, what's important is that there's a lot of people on the edge. It's just how do you connect them in a way that they can support each other? And I found you know, just great opportunities with folks who are in the educational data mining community, uh, people who have spent years in, let's say, human-computer interaction fields that have already spent time thinking about how these systems and these analytics models Models come together. Statisticians as well. I mean, you know, data scientists, you know, in a fairly new term. So I think in that regard, what's key and, and it continues to be reflected just in my own thinking is that we need to do a better job of connecting people because there's an awful lot going on that you don't have to feel quite as lonely as you maybe did 10 years ago when you're trying to you know, push forward into a space that you think is new and all of a sudden you realize, well, there's a whole whack of people here in different domains doing similar things. So that's been very satisfying to see. That's neat. If 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 you had some advice, I mean, I guess I guess we should close up pretty quickly here. But if we, if you had some advice for say some of the graduate students around the world who are looking into this kind of kind of work and just have casual interests, are there things that you would do to target their interests? Would you would you send? The, are there certain kinds of questions you think that would be really fertile areas for people to? look at in in uh, in the near future in terms of learning analytics specifically? yeah well learning yeah. analytics or connectivism generally or even how to look at those connections and yeah well where would you send people now uh, what a great and very complex question yeah. I, I, 
There are definitely areas of interest, and I guess part of the question becomes what kind of skill sets do graduate students need to have today versus perhaps what they needed yeah. to have 15 years ago. And, um, and I remember talking to David Wiley. Uh, he was mentioning uh, the, his university at you know, Brigham Young. Uh, there's increasingly an emphasis there that every student that graduates, every master's student that graduates in their education program uh, have, has to have some familiarity or some background in uh, learning analytics. Because you know, if you're going to go into classrooms in the future, you're already starting to see this, but it's going to be an algorithmic imbued world where you're trying to understand you know what happens when these two two students interact you know how does that interaction influence the grade of the student perhaps down the road or even other uh, things that aren't grade based so i think that's one of the obvious ones is that that uh, students need to get some kind of a background uh, you know fairly developed background in what's now called data science and uh, that's this, this merger of uh, statistics, this merger of visualization analytics tools, uh, really some basic programming skills, whether it's Python or, or uh, you know, something similar that they can begin to manipulate a little bit. Uh, use of uh, open source tools such as R um, to do analysis techniques, but also tools that really bring a lot of that complexity behind the scenes. Let's say Many Eyes is a great example, IBM's tool. Uh, there's a SNAP, you know, S-N-A-P-P, -P, which is a ability to do social network visualizations of uh, uh, discussions that have occurred in Moodle or Blackboard yep. or Desire to Learn. So I think those are the kinds of questions that uh, you can readily apply existing tools to. Uh, but where, where it gets really interesting, I think, is questions about what kinds of questions should educators be asking with our data tools. Uh, you know, just because we know that, let's say, this group of 20 students connected with each other in this and this way, so what? Right? Yeah. You know, we have to get past these pretty little diagrams and network illustrations and really look at what does that say and what does it mean. And because once we get that answer, what does it say and what does it mean, then we can start to think about interventions. Do we want students to be more connected, less connected? Um, looking at things such as discourse analysis, automated discourse analysis, where if you have a group of students discussing and chatting, um, it's reasonable expectation that th their, their interactions are going to be... Uh, evaluated against certain criteria does it show scientific thinking does it not, you know is are there development issues at play and then that should tie to automatic resource provisioning so that everybody receives a personal course based on their strengths and their profiles so questions about that what does that actually look like and piloting that i think is an important element um, more broadly i guess from a connectivist perspective really a lot of empirical research is needed and I think the data sets are easily accessible but what's happened is we haven't spent enough time yet trying to mine those data sets uh, and you know I'm definitely at fault with that because it's much more enjoyable to run an open online course and have conversations with hundreds of learners around the world than it is to sit there and try and crunch through a sequence of conversations <laughs> and determine what that means so I think the empirical basis of learning and network learning needs to increase. And there's various camps doing this. The Network Learning Conference out of, uh, out of Europe has been quite active in this regard. I'm actually finding increased value for this notion of connected learning and connectivism from the learning sciences fields as well, especially physics and uh, other math or science courses which are looking at uh, conceptual development, this notion of concept maps and depth of understanding. And so really, I, I guess you can look at this thing, there's so many areas where there's questions to be asked and for that matter, previous answers to be questioned again, that uh, it really is a fascinating time, I think, to be in the educational technology space as a researcher or, or for that case, you know, for any grad student, it's a great time, I think. Maybe it's time for us to build a research MOOC. We, <laughs> yeah, we know. get an army of people out there networked and creating, yeah, attacking this from a thousand different directions. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. I think you're probably right there. George, thanks so much. This is just great catching up with you. And That's uh, uh, always a pleasure. And I'll look forward to the next time we do it. Great. Well, it was good to connect again. Hope you enjoy the rest of your summer. I will, George. You do it too. All right. Take, take care, care, buddy. Bye. Bye. -bye.